Back then, you had to know everything. These days, a criminal doesn't need to know anything. And because of that, the, the numbers of cyber criminals continue to explode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from Harbor Labs and the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, my conversation with Brett Johnson. He's Chief Criminal Officer at Arcos Labs. So who's got the advantage in cybersecurity, the attacker or the defender? Intelligent people differ on this, but the conventional wisdom is that the advantage goes to the attacker. But why is this? Stay with us and we'll have some insights from our sponsor, Know Before, that put it into perspective. All right, Joe, before we jump into our stories this week, got a little bit of follow-up here. Yeah, what, before what we get we to this, this letter here, I want to ask, I want to I want to follow up on our comments last week from the Twitter checkmark comments. Yeah. Uh, what a what a mess that has become. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that that has gone so sideways yeah. in ways that I had no idea it was going to do that. And actually, you probably I should probably should have been able to see that coming. <laughs> right, last one who leaves turn out the lights. Right, exactly. I'm waiting for fail whales to come back. Uh, do you remember the fail whales? I do not. Uh, the the early whales? days of Twitter, they um, they didn't have enough server capacity to handle the traffic. And oh. so sometimes you'd go to try to use Twitter, and this picture of a whale would come up being – like this whale was being carried by a bunch of birds. It was a it was a stock photo, but right. it got to be known as the fail whale when Twitter wasn't working. So I'm, I'm just counting down the days for the return of the fail whale because, <laughs> uh, you know, whatever engineers got uh, – fired on their way out. You know, they pull the plug on a bunch of servers or something. <laughs> Who knows? But yes, right. you're correct. It is cha- a bit chaotic over at Twitter these days. Yes. <laughs> so we do have a letter from someone who was listening and they said, hi, Dave and Joe, your advice about bookmarking URLs to avoid typos. I find that adding them to my password safe is the best answer. Hmm. And I kind of agree with that. If, yeah. if that's an option for you. Uh, I don't have a password safe that's integrated with my web browser. Mm. Uh, mine is independent of the web browser. It's actually uh, called Password Safe, and I'm moving to uh, KeePass XC, I believe, because I now have a Linux laptop that I use. Okay. And it's a similar thing. It lets you use a YubiKey on Linux. Okay. But I, I digress again. Anyway, so this listener, whose name, by the way, is Graham. I should have mentioned that earlier says that there's three advantages to using your password manager. One, you sync across all browsers and devices, Mm -hmm. which is true with a lot of these browser-integrated password managers. Right. Uh, It's more controlled unless you put effort into your bookmark management. Uh, You could end up clicking on the wrong one, right? That's that's correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, And most importantly, it integrates with the user credential management and encourages further use of the password uh, manager, which is correct. Also, it won't – if you rely on that heavily, it won't let you enter uh, a password into a domain that isn't correct. Yes. I was just going to say that, which is important. Another benefit. So if you're right. using a browser-integrated password manager, that's really the best option. Yeah. And just to clarify on that, what, what we're talking about is that if you go to a domain that looks very, very close to the actual domain you're trying to go to – in other words, someone is trying to spoof – a legitimate domain. Right, with typo squatting or something. Yeah, and you try to use your password manager to put in your credentials, your password manager will say, hold on a second here, cowboy. Right. This is not the domain you think it is. Are you sure? And so it's just a nice additional little level of uh, basically your password manager watching your back for you. Right. Yeah. But Graham goes on to say, with respect to multiple jobs, one of the engineers working for me used to work for a consultancy firm. And when he started... He said he continued to want to do some work with them, which is kind of like a lot like what I'm doing with Harbor Labs and Hopkins, I guess. Yeah. Um, he's doing it out of core hours, and in return, how I got the company to agree to it, he still has access to mentors and experience that come with the consultancy instead of working for a single financial company, which is where he works, mm. where Graham works. Yes, we have to trust that he won't give the consultancy firm any of our data or information but that's a risk I feel is justified and uh, for his and indirectly our benefit as well. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I generally believe that people are ethical. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, a, in a professional setting, yeah, that is a risk that you run. But if these businesses are different enough, 
I think it's a really low risk, and you can make it explicit in the in the employment contract as well. Yeah, we got a number of uh, responses to our conversation about people taking on multiple jobs. Yeah, uh, some people were quite fired up about it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Saying that you know, what's the problem? Um, and I, so, just to clarify, I mean, I think if you're on the up and up with both employers and you let them know what's going on and they're okay with it then I don't see there any problem being, being any problem with it. However, right. I can't think of many employers who would be okay with you having two full-time jobs. Right. Right? It's one thing to have a full-time job and, you know, deliver pizzas on the weekend or do some consulting or pick up some extra work. You know, lots of people do that, and I don't think there's any problem. Again, as long as you're straight with your employer, run it by them, and they say, yeah, that's there's no conflict there. Right. But I think a lot of what we were talking about was people who are not being honest about it, who are taking multiple jobs, um, either to try to have multiple full-time jobs or just outright fraud. Yeah, outright fraud you, it, I, is indefensible, right? Uh, yeah. And if anybody thought that I was endorsing that. No, I'm not. Yeah. No, <laughs> and, no, I don't think anybody was. I think, right. I mean, more of the, the, the steamy feedback we got was from folks who were saying there's nothing wrong with this, that, you know, why that the disagreed with us, that there could be any problem with someone working multiple full-time jobs. And yeah, so, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of falling in that camp. I mean, I understand, uh, understand their, their, their position on it, yeah. uh, that, yeah, well, if, as long as you are performing up to, up to the standards of both jobs to an acceptable level, yeah, I yes, but I would add, and as long as both jobs are okay with it, right? I know, you know, I I think you should be on the up and up and be straight with both of them, uh, and so that they can evaluate you with that in mind, right? So it might help. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, our thanks to Graham for uh, writing in to us. We do appreciate that. We would love to hear from you. Our email address is hackinghumans at the cyberwire dot com. All right, Joe, let's jump into our stories this week. Uh, I'm going to kick things off for us. I actually got uh, a note from our friend, Dr. Christopher Pearson. He is the CEO of the organization called Black Cloak. Uh, I'm pretty sure we've had him on this show. I know he's been a regular guest over on the CyberWire. Um, And uh, Chris's company provides concierge services for uh, high net worth individuals and and uh, high profile individuals. So right. in other words, if you're a, a sports star or you're a CEO of a big company, um, they come in and take care of the kind of the unique problems that you face as someone who's in that situation because, you know, their problems are not like yours and mine <laughs> right. when it comes to people, you know, coming after them and trying to get on their home network. And I mean, even as far as things like kidnapping, uh, which, which happens, you know? right. um, so anyway, their, their company specializes in that sort of stuff. And, uh, Chris was listening to one of our recent episodes, uh, and sent over a report that kind of follows up on something we were talking about. And this is about, um, registration bombing email attacks, uh, there's an article over on the Black Cloak website. We'll have a link to it. It was written by Daniel Floyd. Um, and basically what this involves is, let's say I'm going to do a bit of fraud with you, Joe. Let's right. say that I have gotten my hand, and the example they use here, I have gotten my hands on your walmart.com account information. Okay. Right? So I'm going to log in as you, and I'm going to log into walmart.com, and I'm going to buy something. Right? I'm going to buy myself a new toaster. A new toaster. Right? <laughs> Can I have it shipped to me? Well, when I buy that toaster, Walmart's going to send an email out that says, good news, your new toaster is on the way. Right? And and it's likely that you will see that and go, I didn't buy a toaster. Right. Wait a minute. <laughs> so you could get in there and, you know, maybe stop it or whatever. So what this uh, registration bombing is, is the bad guys use bots to flood your inbox with registration verification emails. Right. So they will set these bots out registering you for hundreds, if not thousands of things. They could be newsletters. They could be, you know, website. Who knows what they could be. But they're all like, please click here to confirm that you signed up for this. Right. And so the plan is hidden within all of these hundreds of nuisance emails that are flooding your box is the message from Walmart. Right. And you're much more likely to miss it when it's in the midst of all of this noise that they're throwing at you yes, over and over again. So uh, I thought this was interesting. It's an interesting report. We'll have a link to it here in the show notes. Um, in terms of um, 
you know, fighting something like this, I, I guess, first of all, be vigilant that if you find yourself being flooded by this sort of thing, just know that it may be right. a, a, an attempt to uh, misdirect you right. because something else is going on. Dave, I, I think I've, I'm going to implement something to mitigate against these kind of attacks because okay. I've been thinking about this for a while. Yeah. I have a number of emails, and if anybody does any amount of cursory research on me, they can probably find these emails. Okay. And the thing about these emails is they're very old. And I love them very much because it's six characters, Dave. <laughs> it's okay. so awesome having a six-character email address. Okay. Uh, but at the same point in time, I've signed up with all kinds of crap with these email addresses. Sure. And I have a Yahoo email address and a, um, and a uh, Gmail address. But I think it's going to be time very soon for me to just start doing email addresses for my own kind of business. Like all the the credit cards that I have. I'm going to have like a credit card email address or maybe like all the bills I have to pay. I'll have a bill email address. Right. Um, and put the credit cards in there with that. Um, you know, banking as well. And, and then I don't use that for anything other than correspondence with these institutions. I see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that way. And I don't publish that. I don't say, Hey, here's my email for you to contact me. That's not the email for you to contact me. That's the email for my bank to contact me. Right. Um, and I think that's that's probably a good idea. I don't know if uh, you know what I'll try it and I'll let you know how it works. You know, there's another method I've seen folks use but, uh, with Gmail. You can append your email address with yeah. a like a, I think is it a plus sign you put after your name or something there's like something that? like that. Yeah, maybe a, no, no. It, it is a plus sign. A dot is something different with Gmail. Yeah, I think it's a plus sign. So in other words, if your if your uh, email address at Gmail was Joe at Gmail dot com, right. you could say Joe and then plus sign banking right. at gmail dot com and you could sign up for all your banking things using that. They would send a message to Joe plus banking at gmail dot com and right. you would get that in your Joe email box, but you it makes it very easy for you to filter. Right. It makes it easy for me to filter, but anybody that sees uh, my email address will know what my email address is. And the yeah, idea that's is true. Then that, they could strip it out. Yeah, they could strip it out. Yeah. No, They're, it's, it's true. I, th Good I think point. the best thing to do is have just have a different Gmail address. They're all free. Yeah. Remember back in the days when you had to get recommended to Gmail? <laughs> you had to know someone. You had to know someone. Yeah, you did. That's how I got uh, my Gmail account. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Nancy Debnam, Times for sending, sending my, my invite. That's right. All right. Well, we will have a link to this report from uh, our friends over at Black Cloak. Again, uh, our thanks to Dr. Christopher Pearson for sending this over. We do appreciate it. Joe, what do you got for us this week? Dave, I know we've talked about these kind of things before yeah. a lot, but the FBI is now talking about a really big step up in tech support scams. Hmm. And they're targeting financial accounts using remote desktop software, which is kind of what the scam is. Okay. The Boston Division of the FBI is warning about a an emerging trend. I don't know that I call this an emerging trend, except for these guys are just getting more sophisticated. Hmm. Uh, it, that what they're doing is the same thing that they've always done, where they uh, where they put a pop up on your screen somehow with with like a website. They have either uh, tricked you into going to some place you shouldn't have gone, right? Or uh, they've compromise some website that you go to anyway, like a watering hole attack. Yeah. Uh, and they say, your computer is infected. Please call Microsoft tech support. Or they'll call you and they'll say, um, you know, we've, we've, this is Microsoft tech support. We found a virus on your computer. Sure. Right. Which should be the first red flag for anybody. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Tech support never calls you. It just <laughs> doesn't happen. Right. I mean, wouldn't it be great if, if that was the way it worked, it would be nice. My they, computer's yeah. not working. Ring, ring. Oh, we noticed your computer's not working. No, that's not how it, it would works. would go right to voicemail. Right. It would. <laughs> so in 2001, nation, I'm sorry, I said 2001. It's 2022. So in 2021, mm. the, um, uh, they, the FBI says that 23,903 people reported losing more than a quarter, or third of a billion dollars due to tech support scams. Wow. Which was a 137% increase uh, over the losses in the previous year. 60% hmm. reported to be over 60 years old. So this is a scam that older people fall for yeah. at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. Probably because they're not digital natives. Could be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I saw a news report on this where they had an agent from the FBI uh, on, on, and she was saying that uh, it's something that definitely targets older users. Hmm. 
Now, we've seen other data that says that older users are less likely to fall for scams. But I think in this scam, they're the, they're the ones that are more likely to fall for it, hmm. right? Because younger users have grown up in this world. They know tech support doesn't call you or reach out to you. Oh, okay. Right? They know mm-hmm. that. Older users might not know this. But get this, Dave. There was a couple from Maine that lost $1.1 million in a tech support scam. Wow. You blinked really slowly there. <laughs> that was <laughs> – that was I saw that number and I, I I had the same reaction. This was after receiving a pop up alert uh, advising them that their computer had been breached. Yeah, and that there was an attempt to compromise their banking information. Mm. Uh, so they were urged to call Microsoft, who then put them on the fo- Microsoft in quotes. And this is in the FBI report, by the way. This is all coming from FBI.gov, and we'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, but I love this. I love the quotes, the use of the quotes here. They got a, co- a call from Microsoft, who then put them in <laughs> touch with a, somebody from Fidelity uh-huh. so that they could uh, transfer their money to Coinbase for safekeeping. Oh. Uh, and these people got away with $1.1 million of these people's money which is absolutely infuriating. There was a New Hampshire resident who lost approximately $1 million after receiving a pop-up alert that she had been hacked. After calling the tech support number, a man with a foreign accent advised her that several bank accounts had been compromised and CSAM had been found on her computer. Hmm. So uh, there is nothing that will short-circuit your thinking faster than that, right? Right, if you're, right. If you're somebody who doesn't understand how computers work, uh, you just understand how to use them, and somebody goes, well, you got some terrible, terrible, terrible stuff on your computer. And the, you know, we're looking at this. Let me, let me help you. Uh, remember, this is what I call the social engineering one, two punch. Mm. You have a problem. I have a solution. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that, that resident law of New Hampshire lost almost a million dollars. There was a Rhode Island woman who lost $200,000. Uh, these, uh, another Massachusetts woman lost $200,000. These are tech support scams that are costing people orders of magnitude more than they used to. Yeah. I mean, many orders of magnitude more. You would, We would get tech support scam stories, and it'd be like, somebody lost $1,000. Somebody lost $2,000. These people are now lo- losing hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. It's amazing. It is. You know, the, lo- just about a week ago, I was uh, at my local uh, CVS drugstore, and I was buying a gift card uh, for a family member's birthday. Mm-hmm. And so I went up to the register to buy my gift card, and uh, I was impressed that— uh, on the little uh, you know device where you put in your credit card information, a message popped up with a warning about gift card scams. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And I had to I had to you know click through, and it was just an extra screen that said, you know, get, we see you're buying a gift card just in case. <laughs> you know, Is here somebody you go. on the phone telling you to buy the gift card? Right. It, and it, it asked a bunch of questions. It, it pointed out things. So. You know, I think that's good that the retailers uh, are are doing taking that extra effort to try to you know. Yeah. Help people understand what may be going on here. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, gosh, uh, word to the wise, right? Uh, millions of dollars lost on uh, on these sorts. That's of probably the retirement savings. I'm sure it is. Yeah, and it's probably gone. Yeah. Oh, sure. It's it's absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah. No, it's awful. All right. Well, we will have a link to that story in the show notes. Uh, Joe, it's time to move on to our catch of the day. <laughs> Dave, our catch of the day comes from a listener. It's a story that was written by the, the listener. He's uh, got an interesting story about a Steam uh, Steam account takeover attempt. So I'm going to let you just go ahead and read Norman's story. Okay. Uh, he writes in and says, My name is Norman. I'm from Germany, and I study computer science. I really enjoy listening to your podcast. Last week, someone tried to steal my Steam account. I was contacted via Discord by a user that sent me a screenshot of my Steam profile and asked me if this was me. After I confirmed that, he told me that he accidentally reported me to Steam, and now my account will be permanently banned. Supposedly, he was scammed on Steam for $450 on a sale, and the scammer had the same profile picture, and that's how he ended up reporting me to Steam. Mm -hmm. Now, to prevent my account from being banned, I should please contact a Steam or Valve developer via Discord or Steam chat who can fix it. This alleged Steam employee sent me a fake certificate saying that he works at Steam. (laughs) After that, he said he would have to search my account to verify I am not the scammer. After this, he will send me an email 
and I should send him the link back so he will be able to perform the verification. The email was a recovery link that would allow my account to be taken over. In the mail was also that the request comes from the Philippines. On my question whether he does not work in the U.S., he answered, but he was just connected via VPN. The texts seem very good, and I couldn't find any serious errors, but I'm not a native English speaker, so maybe I just didn't notice them. Ah. Thank, thanks for your podcast, and please keep up the good work. Best regards, Norman. All right, what, what do we got here? Jim? So that is a very good point. I want to focus on that point first. The Norman, uh, did he say he was from Germany? Yes. So not a native English speaker, but can write and speak English pretty well, probably. Yeah. Most Germans can, actually. Better than most of the scam, yeah. scam, most of the catches of the day that we get here, right? right? So, um, <laughs> but, uh, but Norman makes an excellent point. Not being a native English speaker, being communicated to in English, you might miss what a native English speaker would catch. Sure. Um, I think that's worthy of note. Uh, what's going on here is we've had stories like this before, uh, they're just trying to steal your Steam account because you can you can do the reset my password. I've lost access to my Steam account. Here's the thing about a Steam account, Dave. Yeah. I've spent a good amount of money on games on Steam. Okay. Not tons of money, but over the years, it's probably been more than $1,000. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. If I lost that, I would lose a significant uh, access to a significant amount of things I've purchased. Right. So people know that these things have value. Now, fortunately for me... I don't have a lot of games that people want on my – they're all older games now, right? <laughs> okay. First off, I don't have time to play games anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. I used to love playing like Fortnite and things when during the pandemic, but sure. it's just now we're back to normal and I have just haven't been on the gaming system. Yeah. Uh, but – But is that what they're after here? What, I mean are they after your games? Or are they after they're your... after your account because it has games in it and, it ha- and your games might have items that they can then sell to I other see. people. Okay. Uh, so they can monetize your account and sell that. They can they can sell off your um, your items in any game that you have that are tradable. Uh, I don't play any of those games, so I'm not exactly sure how those work. Okay. Um, there There's other trading things that you get in Steam and, and, and I don't know if you can trade and buy. There's – Gems. I, I don't know what that is. I just ignore it. I don't even know why it's there. Mm-hmm. I, I look at Steam like I want to play a video game. Let me get the video game. <laughs> and maybe I'm right. being the grumpy old man here, but <laughs> why can't I just play my video game? That's right. Right. Go, go to the arcade with my b- b- pocket full of quarters. Pocket full of quarters. That's right. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're coming with this scam. The red flag of this scam should be that oh, I accidentally reported your account, and now you're going to get perma banned. Mm-hmm. which is the fear, right? That's the uh, the artificial pretext with the artificial time horizon and the uh, uh, the ask is you need to call the the guy from tech support. Who isn't a guy from tech support? It's probably the same guy right. with two, two, uh, two accounts. You know that you can have the Discord app open and then you can open a web browser and log into Discord as a different user hmm. and, and talk. Um, or even in Discord now, you can have two accounts logged in and switch between them on the app. Okay. I think that's a relatively new feature. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's old, and I just missed it until recently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I am uh, famously not on Discord because at one point I was because of uh, Grumpy Old Geeks has a Discord area. Right. Uh, and I've just had a lot of trouble logging into Discord um, to the point where I just gave up. <laughs> right. it's like, okay you know you don't want me here fine right <laughs> so, i'm done yeah it's fine. I, I get I, it you know my life goes on yeah. right <laughs> all right well uh again our thanks to norman for uh writing into us we do appreciate him and we would love to hear from you our email address is hackinghumans at the cyberwire.com Let's return to our sponsor's question about the attacker's advantage. Why do the experts think this is so? It's not like a military operation where the defender is thought to have most of the advantages. In cyberspace, the attacker can just keep trying and probing at low risk and low cost, and the attacker only has to be successful once. And as No Before points out, email filters designed to keep malicious spam out have a failure rate of over 10%. That sounds pretty good. Who wouldn't want to bat nearly 900? But this isn't baseball. If your technical defenses fail in one out of ten tries, you're out of luck and maybe out of business. The last line of defense is your human firewall. You can test that firewall with Nobefore's free phishing test, 
which you can order up at knowbefore.com slash fish test. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash fish test. All right, Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Brett Johnson. He is the chief criminal officer at Arcos Labs. A uh, really interesting guy, interesting interview. Here's my conversation with Brett Johnson. The United States Secret Service referred to me as the original Internet Godfather. Now, the way I got the title was 39 felonies because 38 just ain't enough. A place <laughs> on the United States Most Wanted list, I escaped from prison and I built and ran the first organized cybercrime community. It was called Shadow Crew. It was a, a precursor to today's Darknet. Darknet markets laid the foundation for the way modern cybercrime channels operate today. The 39 felonies had to do with refining modern financial cybercrime as we now know it. And yes, that does get one sent to prison, deservedly so. And usually that's where the story ends. If, if the bad guy gets out of prison, he is soon to go back to prison and he stays the rest of his life there. I was very fortunate uh, with the help of my wife, my sister, and then finally the FBI. I was given the opportunity to turn my life around. I took it and today I... Uh, I lead a very blessed life today. I'm a spokesperson for AARP. I speak across the planet. I'm chief criminal officer for Arcos Labs. Um, life is good. Life is good. <laughs> well, good for you. And I suppose, I mean, that really gives you a unique insight into both sides of these things that we're facing here today. I mean, what drew you to when you were on the dark side? What was the appeal there? You know, I come by crime somewhat naturally. Um, I'm from Eastern Kentucky. My mother was a fraudster, and I grew up in that type of environment. Uh, from the age of 10 forward, I was always committing some sort of crime. Frauds, scams, stuff like that, until I branched off into the internet age. And what you find with online crime is the way to develop trust with a potential victim is much easier than it is if you're in person. But not only that, you you don't have to see the consequences of your actions. So you don't have to see the harm that you're causing that person that you're victimizing or that company that you're victimizing. So you're able to compartmentalize your life. At the same time, it's it's almost like a puzzle type mentality. And I love puzzles. So it's it's how do you get past this security system? What tools do you need to use? What do you need to do to get access, information, data, or cash? Um, so that was very appealing. At the same time, I was very good about it. And um, what you see is if you're able to do something that no one else in your criminal community can do, you gain the respect of every single person in that environment. And that respect equates to cash, of course, but it also is one hell of an ego boost. So all that rolled in together is internet crime. And you were successful, I, I guess, for many years, right up until the moment when you weren't, right? <laughs> when, when, the, when, the consequences, when the consequences came, yes? Well, I, that's that's a very good way to put it. I, I was doing just fine until I wasn't. Um, <laughs> I mean, we uh, we the group that I ran, as I said, it was the first organized community that did this. We had four thousand members, and the the way we got caught, one of our members got picked up. He goes to work for the United States Secret Service, and it ends up getting the site busted. Uh, we made the front cover of Forbes, August of two thousand four, with the headline "Who's Stealing Your Identity." October 26, 2004, the United States Secret Service, they swoop in, arrest 33 people in six countries in six hours. I'm the only person publicly mentioned as getting away. Um, you're right. It was very successful until it wasn't. But at the same time, it's um, leading a life of crime, whether you're caught or not, is a um, it's a very stressful <laughs> anxiety-ridden existence where you lie to every single person that you know and don't know. Um, and you, you, you lose yourself pretty quickly in that type of environment. So it's, uh, most people don't realize that. Most people think that, uh, you know, if you're committing crime, as long as you're not caught, you're good to go. But um, that's not true at all. As you look at the state of things today, I mean, compared to how it was when you were operating, have things changed very much? They have. When I was operating, the the sophistication was in the criminal themselves. So the, the whoever the attacker was, 
back then, you had to know every single aspect or dynamic of everything that you were doing. You had to understand the security system of the companies. You had to understand your own operational security so that you weren't identified. You had to understand the uh, the way the tools and the processes and the techniques that you were using to attack, you had to understand how those things worked. You had to understand drop addresses. So every single thing along the way, you had to, you had to know how to launder money. These days, the sophistication is no longer in the criminal. The sophistication is in the platform. Now we have cybercrime as a service, and we continue to see these products and services that are developed like uh, Caffeine or Evil Proxy or Genesis Bot Marketplace. You see these products and services that are developed understanding that the 98 percentile of cyber criminals are not sophisticated. They don't really understand much of anything, but they don't need to anymore because it's done for them. Everything is off the shelf products, services. Uh, you can buy a tutorial for $10 that will walk you through how to commit one specific type of fraud. You can take live instruction classes. It runs anywhere from $300 up to $3,000. Or if you don't want to spend any money at all, you can simply go to a forum, start asking some questions, and Usually, you'll get the help that you need in order to defraud some individual or some organization. So that's that's the difference now is back then you had to know everything. These days, a criminal doesn't need to know anything. And because of that, the, the numbers of cyber criminals continue to explode. And as you look at it, you know, the, the situation that we're, we're faced with today, do, do you have any thoughts on what it might take to tamp down some of this? Are there are there areas that frustrate you where, you know, if only law enforcement did this or if, if only this would happen, we'd have a better chance of shutting some of these things down? Well, I, I want to be fair to law enforcement. I think that law enforcement does an outstanding job. The problem is, and I'll, I'll give you a pro, the, the, my view of that right now. Um, mm. So across, across the United States, you've got 37,000 FBI field agents spread across 56 field offices. Of those 37,000 field agents, you've only got about 200 that concentrate on cybercrime. Of those 200, a lot of them concentrate on nation state attacks. So you're dealing with less than 200 agents that are trying to fight millions of cyber criminals across the planet, trying to worry about jurisdictional boundaries, uh, companies or countries that are protecting these criminals. The internet itself is, is, it lends itself toward anonymity. So you've got all these issues that go on, and it's not just the FBI. For example, we had a lot of stimulus fraud. Well, the Small Business Association has a total of 29 investigators across all 50 states. So all these issues, you don't have enough law enforcement to take care of the problem. So that's that's issue number one. Another issue is, is, is that cyber criminals are very good about sharing and exchanging information. We, and I say we because I used to be one, we are very open source. The good guys are not. The good guys have privacy concerns, they have regulations, and they have competitive edges. A lot of the times, a company will not share how they're being attacked because they want that attack to go to their competitors. That's a problem because it, it really makes things easier for a criminal to come in and victimize you. At the same time, that threat landscape tends to be developed, because, and I'll quote a few statistics here. 90% of every single attack uses known exploits. So it's not zero-day attacks. It's not unknown vulnerabilities. It's the things we know about that we've potentially been told about for years that we're not doing anything about that causes a problem. 56% of companies have experienced a breach because of third-party access. Your system, your network, is only as strong as the weakest device which accesses it. Most companies have no idea how many third parties are accessing their systems. Of those third parties, none of them have been vetted. So that's another stat. 41% of every single router on the planet has the default password. That's your you at your house. That's your financial institution. 92% of every breach begins with a phishing attack. So you, you, you think of things like this. This establishes that threat landscape that criminals come in and they just find where the holes are. And at the same time, you know, you've, you've got, you don't have enough manpower with, with uh, law enforcement. You've not practiced proper cybersecurity hygiene. And let's be honest, a lot of security companies out there are snake oil salesmen. They will tell you, hey, our product is the only one that you need. Complete lies. Or they'll come up with a good product and never innovate on that product. So you've got a lot of issues out there that open the door for a criminal to come in and victimize you or your organization. 
You know, you're walking down the street in, in any big city and, and uh, you might come across some folks doing a three-card Monty kind of thing. You know, you're, you're street-level fraud. And I think a lot of people will see that and they'll know, they'll say right away, oh, that, you know, there's, there's no way to win that. But there are enough people out there who don't know that, that the fraudsters get away with it. I mean, to what part of, in the cyber domain do you think educating our users plays a part in this? I think that uh, it's not only about educating users, it's also about educating everyone across the board. So you're, you're this, this I've, I've talked, I've been to conferences and I've talked to the salespeople on the floor for different companies and the salespeople know the talking points of the product that they're selling, but they have no idea what cybercrime, identity theft, online fraud or anything else looks like, what cybersecurity, those issues are. They just know the talking points. So they've not been educated. And I see that across the board. It's, I think what, what we're dealing with is we have to, you educate your customers, you educate your employees, you educate management, you educate the people who are selling the products and services to you. And that's, that's a huge, huge effort to do that. But I think it's an absolute necessity. At the same time, you have to get to the point where you're sharing and exchanging information. On the criminal side, we understood years ago that by educating everyone across the board, everyone becomes more knowledgeable, but everyone becomes more profitable. On the good guy's side, they have to start to understand, hey, by educating everyone, everyone becomes more knowledgeable and more safe at the end of the day. That's what we have to do. We have to get to the point where we're not hiding the breaches that are going on, that we're reporting to law enforcement, that we're not only reporting to law enforcement, but we're following up with prosecution. A lot of the times you see companies that are scared to prosecute because it sends a bad message to their existing customers. And that message tends to be, well, you can't trust our environment. We're past that now. Most companies have already been breached. People, people worldwide understand that, hey, cybersecurity is an issue. Most companies, my information is out there, everything else like that. So we have to be willing to prosecute. And when you send the message that, hey, we will send you to prison, it does. I can tell you for a fact, it does have an effect on cybercrime communities. These communities share this information. This company prosecutes. So, so those criminals tend to try to find different targets other than those. I'm curious, Brett, you know, just from your own life, how do you go about protecting yourself and your loved ones from these sorts of things? Obviously, you know, you have a high level of knowledge and I'm sure you can see a scam coming a mile away, but not everyone in your family probably can. Well, you say that, but there was one year, uh, about three years ago, I was hit four times in one year. Um, so it, it can happen to anyone. And sometimes I'm in, a, in an audience and someone says, well, that would never happen to me. I think that's a blind side that you have. And that's the type of person that I would want to talk to if I were still a criminal, uh, someone who has those blinders on. It's important to practice, to, to, to be situationally aware online as, good, as well as you are offline. You know, when we're in our physical world, we are well aware if we go into a bad neighborhood or if something, if something is wrong in our environment. Our, our situational awareness is pretty high. Online, it's not. Online, it's like, you know, we have no clue what's going on. We don't understand that there are predators in our environment, in any environment that we're on. Um, I don't care what the website is. I don't care if it's social media, if it's a retailer merchant. There are predators everywhere that are trying to get you. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be scared or paranoid. It just need, means that you need to be aware that there are sharks in that ocean. What I say is that you know, cybercrime to commit it is not really sophisticated. It's not rocket science. It's not really rocket science to protect yourself either. As an individual, the things that you can do is you can put a credit freeze on every single person in the house. That's free. Credit freezes stop all new account fraud. Works great for kids. So yes, you need to put a credit freeze on your children too. But start there. Monitor accounts and place alerts. Because a credit freeze stops new account fraud, it doesn't stop fraud on existing accounts. So freeze your credit, monitor accounts, place alerts on those accounts, and then finally use a password manager because 70, 80% of everyone on the planet uses the same or similar logins across multiple websites. So that takes care of that issue. Those, I think, are the three big things to do. From there, you can use multi-factor authentication. You can add other things onto it. The idea being to take a multi-layered approach to your security. Understand your place in the cybercrime spectrum. Understand how a criminal will attack you. 
what is that criminal looking for from you? Is he looking for information, access, data, cash, a combination of those things? Design your security around the way that you will be attacked. For, for a company, it's still a multi-layered approach, understanding that a criminal has a toolbox and he has a variety of tools with which, with which to attack you. You need a toolbox as well, well, with a variety of tools to defend yourself. So you need identity uh, verification processes. You need to be looking at the biometrics on the site, the device info. You need something to combat uh, the automated attacks because over 50% of all internet traffic is bot driven. So you need that. Um, and and these, these tools are not, they're not complicated. They're, 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 they can be very effective when used in a multi-layered approach to security. So I think that that tends to be the answer. And we, we have to get to the point also where we're where we're sharing this information, where we're not blaming the victim for the crimes that are perpetrated upon them. So we, there, are, there are tons of issues out there that we need to address. You know, when you look back to the time in your life when you were a criminal, how do you think about that time? I mean, do you, do you try to stay positive that there were positive lessons that, that came away from it? Do you, do you have regret? How, how do you look back on it? I have a, <laughs> I have a lot of regret, a, a lot of regret. Um, I usually say that I lead a, a blessed life today that I don't deserve, but I'm damn grateful to have. And there's, there's a lot of truth to that. I don't see any, any benefit at all from leading a criminal lifestyle. I think that, um, it's a despicable life. I think that it's a, uh, despicable behavior. You, uh, you, victimize everyone. You hurt everyone. You, you hurt people you knew, people you don't know. You hurt yourself. Uh, I mean, it's, um, there's absolutely no benefit to leading a criminal lifestyle at all. And I think about that every single day, every day. And uh, I work hard every single day to protect businesses and consumers from that type of person that I used to be. Joe, what do you think? That that was an interesting story, Dave. <laughs> it's an interesting guy. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, talk about a you know, colorful, interesting life. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, Brett makes two points early on. One, it's easier to get someone to trust you over the internet, mm. which is probably true. And I think I, I've been thinking about this for a while. Why is that? Why does that work? And I think it's because people don't understand what's going on behind the scenes in their computer. Mm. You know, they they've never had to understand how to how to connect things, right? Like, yeah. Remember when you and I were on uh, bulletin board services back in the 80s and 90s? Yeah, yeah. We had to know how to do all that stuff. Yeah. Now dial you up, get a computer. Dial up modems. Yeah. Right. Uh. Now you get a computer, and the hardest question about connectivity is what's the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> right, right, right. That's right. it. It's not what's the baud rate, what's the stop bits, yeah. what, what client do I use? Mm -hmm. None of that, mm -hmm. right? So... I think the fact that all that stuff is abstracted away from the user kind of makes it mysterious. Hmm. Or I know it does, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think that, that that mystery is what makes it easier to trust somebody when they say, hey, I know what's going on, mm. right? Right. So you're already, I don't want to say suspending disbelief, but you're already accepting a certain level of technological magic. Yes. So what's a little bit more? Exactly. That's <laughs> my point. Okay. Uh the other thing is that bad guys don't have to witness the consequences of their actions. Yeah. Mm. Which means if you're doing something terrible to people and you get to see what happens, mm -hmm. that's going to have an impact on you. Not seeing it, you can walk away. Mm -hmm. you, don't have, you don't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's easier to sleep at night. Interesting that he says that, um, that a life of crime is a stressful existence kind of glad to hear that. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's also the reason why I'm not a criminal <laughs> because I know it's one of the many reasons I'm not a criminal, Dave. There's a lot of reasons why I'm not a criminal. One, because I tend not to be a bad guy. Right. Or at least I think I'm not a bad guy. But uh, I, I couldn't handle the stress. The stress would absolutely kill me. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would be it. Right. I, I just imagine a, a life looking over your shoulder all the time. That, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Going through the various defenses of a of a system that's been put to stop you from getting access is like a puzzle to these guys. Mm -hmm. That's a hundred percent correct. That's why they do it, right? It's really attractive to them. And now there's big rewards at the end of it. Yeah. So why not? It's fun and it's profitable. 
Right, right up until the moment you get caught. <laughs> right up until the moment, yeah, you go to prison. That's, right, that's right. when it stops being fun and yeah. profitable. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting about his observations on the specialization in the criminal world. Uh, this is almost like, it's almost like buying, using QuickBooks or buying some other software. Mm-hmm. That, and and this, is, this is the way it's, we've been watching it. You and I have been watching this go on for uh, a number of years now, and we've been talking about it, that there's, it's, Commercial off-the-shelf software, essentially, and commercial off-the-shelf processes. Right. Uh, you can get trained up in how to do this quickly. And these guys are very open about sharing their uh, their techniques and their practices and their tools. That You can just go get them. And one of the things he points out is that the people that they're fighting against or working against don't do that. Mm. Like law enforcement has certain requirements on them. They can't make everything public in an ongoing investigation. Mm-hmm. They can't share information. Corporations don't want to share information because, in his in his estimation, is because they don't uh, they would rather the bad guys attack their competition. Right. Um, that I, I would imagine there's some of that that goes on, but there are ISACs where people share information about this. I think the bigger concern there is that they don't want litigation. Corporations don't share information because then that becomes actionable in court. Yeah, I, I I I agree. I think that's a big part of it, I, and I also think they just don't want the PR of right. people knowing that they fell victim to something. Yeah, you know? and actually, Brett talks about that in this interview. He goes, "It's it's normal now," yeah. and he says uh, he goes on to talk about uh, that people should be prosecuting these criminals when they can, mm-hmm. because if you start prosecuting, they then you get a reputation for being prosecutorial, having a prosecutorial nature, and the bad guys leave you alone. Right. Uh, yeah, take the reputational hit a couple of times, but put a couple of people in prison. Mm-hmm. And maybe they stop attacking you. you know, be the quiet guy, the quiet <laughs> right. kid that gets beat up. It's like, right. you know, you're on the schoolyard, right? <laughs> and the bully comes up to you and starts hitting you. Just punch him in, you know, punch him in the face a couple of times. Yeah, you put one of suspended. your men in the hospital, you put one of theirs in the morgue. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Don't listen to me, kids. I'm a terrible. I'm a terrible giver of advice for modern schools. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the stats he rattles off at the towards the end of the interview seem pretty accurate to me. I, I can't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, you know, that's the way stats are. They go out of your out of your head almost immediately. But if they seem shocking, don't be shocked by those. Those are probably accurate. <laughs> right. Uh, I like his his uh, his. Recommendations for keeping keeping yourself safe, uh, and and these are things we don't normally say. He does say password manager and multi factor authentication, right. which are my two big ones. But he says credit freeze and alerts on your existing accounts. You know, Dave, I was talking with my wife today. We have a credit card that will not send me text messages when a purchase is made. It only sends me a summary email every day hmm. to the email account that I was just complaining about. I never check, hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So uh, I I think I've made a decision. I'm just going to get rid of that credit card. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna close it and be done with it and not not have to worry about it anymore. I like the other credit cards that all say, "Hey, so you know, like my son has a card that he uses when I want him to go out and do something that I need him to do." Last night he we had Chinese. I got an alert when he picked up the Chinese. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, absolutely. there it was, and yeah. I, I knew when it was spent. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah, seems like table stakes these days. It is. Yeah, it's basic. Yeah, and this other company can't do it. Yeah. And yeah, there you go. All right. Well, our thanks to Brett Johnson for joining us. Uh, Again, he is the chief criminal officer at Arcos Labs. We do appreciate him taking the time. And we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. Our thanks to Harbor Labs and the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at harborlabs.com and isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening.